a meeting or? Yeah, along on water board, Monday, September 19th. Okay. You want to do the roll call? Yes. Uh, Roger Lane? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Tom Duster? Here. Uh, staff, uh, Ken Houston's here. Uh, Wes Lowry? Yes. Kevin Bowden? Here. <coughs> Hope Lardley? Here. And David Bell? Here. And Council Member Marsha Martin? Here. Okay, Mayor, uh, Chair, we have a quorum. All right, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, how about Jason? Is he here? Um, he's in the middle of a project, so I'm going to cover for him today. It's a skeleton crew. <laughs> okay, let's uh, talk about approving previous month's minutes. Any comments or questions about the minutes from last, last month? Is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. I second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Who's doing the water status report? That'll be me, Roger. <coughs> okay, um, very good. Yeah. The flow on the St. Brian lines this morning was uh, 34 CFS. And so the historic average, 125 year historic average, is uh, 54 CFS. The call on the St. Brian Creek is the Nylock Ditch uh, with a priority date of June 1st, 1865. The call on the main stem of the South Pot River was Harmony Ditch with a priority date of uh, May 3rd, 1897. Uh, right now, Ralph Price Reservoir at Mountain Rock was full and spilling at an elevation of 6400.2 and passing the full North St. Rain uh, over the spillway, which is approximately 26 CFS. Uh, Union Reservoir was at an elevation of 25.2 feet or 10,756 acre feet, which is down approximately 2,000 acre feet from fill and releasing 16 CFS. On September 1st, 2022, St. Rain Creek Basin storage for that was at 71%. So we're pretty dry out there, um, just from the flow on the St. Rain. Yeah. Just a question, a year ago, if you can remember, was the health price full of this building also? Yes. Is it typical? For Occasionally we release some water in September, but we try to not start releases until you know, October. Hopefully, even as late as November 1st. Yeah, great. All right. Any questions for Kevin? Anyone? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I don't see anybody from the public here, so we'll just move beyond that one. Any uh, agenda revisions or submissions, Kim? We have them. Okay. Item seven, development activity. None and none. So we'll just go to item eight. I guess we'll assess you. So this is the board's quarterly review for cash and lieu. Um, let's remind everyone that it was back on March 8th when City Council uh, approved resolution 2022-35, set the fee for cash and limit uh, confirmed $48,500 per acre feet, and that um, that was based um, on the uh, Windy Gap Farming Project in its entirety, which was uh, the equivalent of $30,000 per acre foot for the original Windy Gap version of the pumping project, and $18,500 for the City's current investment in the Way Gap Farming Project. And we were hoping, well, I shouldn't say we were hoping, we were anticipating there being some information on Way Gap sales uh, for PRPA, but we had contacts with them. And it looks like that's not going to happen or be available until spring of next year. So we don't have any new data in terms of uh, changing cost. The uh, project itself is using some of the contingency money. As they expected, and um, but we believe there's um, sufficient contingency money in there to continue with the project. So, with all that being said, um, the we're recommending no change to the current deep cash and lift. And, and what 
looking for. You don't see much changing those numbers. We do not. We'll we'll continue to update the board. The next. I would say substantial piece of information would come with the sale of CBT or if we get to where they <clears throat> request the participants to contribute additional dollars because of low funds in the contingency fund. But right now that's not being anticipated. So I think based upon council's direction, we're right where we should be. Tom Reynolds, any comments? Yeah. I mean Oh. How have we, have we had applications? I think the last time we spoke about this, most people were trying to get in before the changeover. Have we had folks come in after? Bringing cash in lieu? Yeah. Yeah, um, good question. Um, there was a lot of people that came in but right before. Mm -hmm. um, actually have one in the process right now of uh, bringing a check in. I think that check was for around $170,000. Which seems like a lot, but it actually only represents like you know three or four acre feet. But um, but we have seen cash and lube coming into the city's coffers from after this change. So there's still projects are still moving forward as they have been. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I've always been a proponent of. of more information yeah. uh, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot more to, to base an opinion on so I don't see any rationale really for a change relative to previous discussions that we've had on the, on the concepts anything else that's all I have yeah. all right um, so item nine um, Going to take that, Ken. Yeah, um, first item to report on is uh, some of our engineering projects that are ongoing right now. Um, probably the two most significant projects are um, the we have constructing a pump station from the South Saint Ring pipeline to be able to pump into the North Saint Ring pipeline to pick up um, some of the winter water on our south diversion. It's a little more difficult to get otherwise. Um, that project, the pump is in, and that's why Jason's not here today. They're actually doing the tie-in from, from the pump station to the north pipeline. So they're um, cutting the pipe and, and putting it together. That'll take a couple days to do, but won't, won't, won't be too big of a, too, too lengthy of a project. But that's going on right now, so that's good. Um, should make the project halfway operational by, by sometime later in October, so that's, that's good news. It's actually one of the last of our, some of the last of our, the purchase of that pump station, some of the last of our flood projects. So we're, 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 we're that close to getting, getting that done. Um, the second project we've got going on right now is um, some repairs to the outlet uh, of Flood Rock Dam. Uh, we had a failure of a, of a Flange gasket, and in addition, um, on, on our, jet, our low flow, jet flow gate, as well as the actual regulating gate where it seats down was, was leaking. And so we took the opportunity before, since the spillway is still spilling, all the water coming down can go over the spillway so it doesn't impact the stream at all. This time of year, it's kind of critical to do that work this time of year. You can't do it in the summer because you get in with too much flow over the spillway. You can't do it uh, after November because we lose our St. Green supply canal. So there's always a real tight window in September when we try to start a project like that. So that's just started and Jason's up working with that as well. So hopefully both of those two projects, um, getting the old seat out of the old regulating gate is already out. So that part of the project going now, you know, just getting a, a new seat put in and start. So that should be coming along pretty good. Um, and then the last, and I probably should have, hopefully this will come up. I was going to give you a quick update on the Windy Gap filming project. I should have turned that on a little while ago. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm sure Mr. Can I ask a quick question? Robert, do we need a affirmative vote on the cash in this? Well, I my opinion is since nothing's changed and everybody I, I didn't see that there would need to be one. Yeah, we we normally only vote if it's a recommendation to council. Right. Good question. I thought about that but I where I came out. Wake up today. There we go. Nice picture, Kim. You look so happy. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So that's an actual picture from today. Wow. The Chimney Hollow project. So that's hot off the press. Um, you can actually see. Um, so there's the quarry that's been there a while, but you can see the um, asphalt plant is up there. That, that area, when the project's done, becomes the parking area for the Larimer County Recreational Area, which will be good, um, but you can see that. The bridge over the penstock is um, much, you can really see it now. Uh, and then they're still working on the plinth. We've got a little bit more to do here, and then a little tiny bit, but a good portion of the plinth is down and now constructed. A little bit of the rock fill is starting, um, and then over on this side you can so you can see the footprint of the dam very well, and over on this side you can see some of the downstream uh, filter uh, where any seepage would be picked up and filtered and taken out in a controlled fashion. So. That's it. Uh, it probably doesn't look a whole lot different than last month, or even when we were up there turning it. To, um, it it uh, it's coming along well, um, and I think I don't know if we reported last summer we did have the groundbreaking on the connectivity channel that went well. And um, the nice thing about having groundbreaking, it, it was kind of a quick. Um, got the permit and, and that allowed some of the funding to come in, which allowed the contract to be let, which allowed the groundbreaking, which has allowed some of the last of the funding to come through. It's kind of, a, everything was sitting there. Hey, we're, you know, we thought everything was ready to go, but um, it's now going. So the connectivity channel with a little bit of luck in, in, in uh, um, Grand Lake, uh, Grand County area, we'll have a little bit of time this this fall to get some construction done. You know, kind of, you can smoke there pretty quick, <laughs> but um, they they're getting started, so that's that's good. And that's all I. Think. And, you know, and maybe this fluctuates a lot, but as far as being on schedule, is there a sense it's where we hoped it'd be, or it is. It's probably. Um, one of the ways you look at that is expenditure of expected expenditure of funds and, and you know <coughs> how much you've expended. We're we're in the, about that ninety percent, ninety five percent range, so as as close as you can predict a construction project of this scale. So um, right now it's tracking on schedule. Financially is costs or and um, financially we're you know as you would expect there are some change orders for mostly varying conditions in the foundation and, and a few other things but um, for the most part yes the, um, we're still well within the, within the budget no, no big no big change orders yet. any other questions for Ken okay thanks Ken um, so that's what Elson or Jason would report on. Anything else? That's all we have on the budget. So we uh, hope. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick update on um, a conference um, slash workshop that we attended last week. Um, it's called Growing Water Smart. And um, it's a yearly workshop put on by the Sonoran Institute and the Babbitt Center for Land Use Planning. Um, and basically it's to put people who normally don't work together in the same room um, so that we can connect the dots between development and water resources. Um, so Ken and I were able to go um, and then we had three planners, a long-term planner, an environmental planner, um, and a development review. 
uh, among some other wonderful GIS people. And we had a really wide array of, of people um, on our team to go up to Estes Park. And um, it's, it's basically like a deep dive into where we want to see our city go um, in the face of our water resources um, and development, hand in hand. Um, so we developed an action plan, um, and bless you, sorry, that's okay. And part of um, one of the perks of going to this um, workshop is that it opens up opportunities for funding. Um, so we kind of created this mission statement for our Growing Water Smart team, which is um, not just the team that went, but a variety of other people who work on water-related projects in the city. So we have parks and open spaces, and stormwater, and floodplain, and all kinds of water is involved in everything. So um, got people from all across the board on this over large team. And you guys may remember that Francie went in 2020. And so this is our second, Francie and Ken, went um, in 2020. So this is our second time attending. Um, this time was different because we got to be in person. So um, we feel it was, much more valuable to create those networking opportunities and personalized relationships with people. Um, so we feel very much more motivated and um, we created an action plan and a mission statement that I'll read for you. Um, Despite the adversity we faced, Longmont is an adaptable community that continues to be a responsible steward of our resources. But Colorado is challenged by water issues and Longmont is not as resilient as we could be. Our path forward can better reflect our values. Therefore, we can commit to fostering an equitable, safe, and resilient community that contributes to Colorado's water future. So basically, um, we came up with some overarching long-term goals. Um, the long-term, the long horizon goal is we would like to update our code of design standards to reflect water efficiency better um, so that we are developing with water efficiency in mind instead of having to focus on retrofitting developments that are new. Um, we also want to coordinate upcoming plan updates with water efficiency in mind. So as you all know, we have our water efficiency master plan update coming up. Um, that's going to lay a lot of the groundwork and language for other plans to borrow from. Um, so Parks and Open Space is, is doing um, an update as well as sustainability and then the city's comprehensive plan is also hopefully going to be updated soon as well. Um, so we're really making sure to have a coordinated effort between all of those plan updates so that we're all on the same page and developing and planning for the same goals. Um, and we're going to do all of this with projects that are um, data-driven um, so we can have data-driven proof um, decisions. Um, lots of community engagement and outreach, um, lots more efficiency on public property. Um, so in our last month's meeting, we mentioned um, the city becoming kind of a role model for water efficiency, and that was a big part of what we wanted to do. We want to focus on what we can we can control here, kind of get some quick, fast, easy wins, um, develop some case studies, get really good data on why we should be water efficient, um, so that we can prove to council eventually someday why we should update our code and prove what works and um, how it saves water by being efficient. Council is probably those updates, so good. <laughs> Just get them ready. We're ready. We're not ready. We're we we're ready to be ready. <laughs> um, and we broke it out into subcommittees, um, which is probably the main difference between how this how we're moving forward with the project management of Growing Water Smart versus now versus 2020. Um, and so it's not just me, as it was just Francie kind of coordinating, wrangling the cats. Um, we kind of are doing a subcommittee approach to disseminate and delegate leadership um, so we can hold accountability more. So yeah, we're excited. Where, where was the meeting going to take place? It was in Estes Park, and it was three days of pretty intense breakout workshops facilitated brainstorming um, but it was it was really great a lot of every, all of the planning is really excited um, and we're we're excited to to get these projects moving are the communities attending um four other communities attended 
Um, so Cheyenne was there, which was the first from Wyoming to ever participate, and then us and Broomfield, Windsor, and Lyons. So five. And it was great to have Lions there too, since we're right next door and we provide the tree water. So it was good to collaborate with them. Very good. Anything else? No. All right, thanks a lot. Yes. Um, question about what kind of the long term uh, vision looks like as far as turf in terms of turf replacement and also codes as far as what we have in our future development. Uh, that's something that is going to be part of what is going to be presented to yeah. City Council. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> so I have a question, a, a, a reinforcing question maybe about that. Uh, um, I, first of all, just have to brag a little bit. I just had my turf inverted yes. and have zero escape um, plants and a drip system in my yard now and I'm doing all of the scup work of mulching it and you know all that stuff. It doesn't require any skills and I'm not very strong at. But um, what we the situation we've got is that Wapa can um, adopt policies or even codes that uh, uh, manage um, Households, right? You know, or have to do with single family home turf removals. Um, but existing HOAs, and I'm not sure about, you know, future HOAs um, that maintain their own green air spaces, I don't think we have any ability to tell them they have to pull out their turf and re landscape that because um, homeowners associations are quasi-governmental agencies that are sort of um, not underneath the municipality in certain ways. And so I wondered whether that was discussed, um, you know, recently, within the last few years recently, the state legislature um, awarded homeowners in HOAs the right to Zero escape their own property regardless of what their HOA covenants are, mm -hmm. but that doesn't speak to the uh, land that is maintained by the HOA covenants. So I just wondered whether that was put on the table. Um, you know, it's been discussed on the legislative side that you know we would like to get the we would like to request that our representatives try to broaden that exception uh, at the state level so that the HOAs don't have to, you know, we can, we can restrict the amount of turf that they use. Um, so, question for you. Yeah, um, that specifically did not come up. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't aware of that, so that's good. I mean, that's something that we're hoping to do a lot of is really deep dive into our current code and design mm -hmm. standards um, and figure out like, because right now our code is very vague um, and it says things like preferred, like preferred low water plants. And like, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, so we're hoping that in our, in as we move forward with these projects that we really do some deep dive into our current code current laws, um, what we can and can't do, um, and that is has a lot to do with HOAs too. Mm -hmm. um, I can speak to um, a lot of community members are really interested in doing um, a lot of like retrofits in their HOA con areas, mm -hmm. and I feel like if it's resident um, driven, then the HOA will most, are, are more mm -hmm. likely to adopt that, but um, that's good to keep in mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And, and one thing that the our legislator could maybe even help a little bit is when I read when I re read the statute on you can't compel a property owner in an HOA um, and it, they don't use the term HOA either uh, and then some community something <laughs> uh, but but it's HOAs. 
it's clear that you can't compel the private property owner. There are some that don't feel that applies to the HOA itself. That you, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And and I I read it that and I'm not an attorney. So okay. I'm not. I, I kind of think that you also quote can't compel the HOA, but it's not clear enough. And, and so I okay. think yeah, that would be great. If well, that would be great. I mean, if we changed our code so that you know you're you're limited on turf or you have to reduce or something, and I mean, I'd be happy to test that. Yeah. You know. So maybe getting an opinion on how far that extends. Yeah. It's, it's an area we probably need to look at a little harder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Marcia, where is this heading for single family residences? What? Where is it heading? Well, what lies down there? Is there, is there a discussion about having codes for them? Is what? How much turf they can no. have, or, or is that right a discussion? Or right what? now, no. I mean, right now, what's happening, as David could probably explain it better than I have, is that we're we're focusing on on incentives now. You want to yeah. maybe explain because I don't know, for example, how much more we put in the budget for incentives. So year. that probably is a can and hope piece. So there, we we on the park side are the ones that are doing stuff internally in the parks on some of the city properties that we have right now so we are actually taking steps to do conversions for a couple of reasons one to get out in front and see what really works um, to reduce the water demand for the city but also then to be an example for our residents and say here's something you can come out and actually look and it can be a demonstration type product be that conversion of grass types to different grass types or as you did take it from turf to some sort of xeric landscaping mm -hmm. so I don't know on the bringing dollars in if we've done anything yet to help with the residential side? Yes, we, we have. <coughs> yeah, um, so we work with Resource Central um, mm -hmm. and last summer was our like trial period to see how successful it was. It was wildly successful. We had 40 something applicants and could only fund like 12 projects. Huh? So um, we, are, we doubled our budget for next year. Um, and then we also have applied for a grant through St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy District to give us more money so that we can make it bigger. But mm -hmm. but the plan is to increase those incentives year over year. Um, and, and then state funding will come into play as well. So the CWCB, um, the House bill that just passed recently for the turf um, removal incentives will get, hopefully, will apply to get some money through them as well. Mm -hmm. So, David, uh, from a city standpoint, some of our properties on, you're talking parks and what, are you zeroing in on a particular uh, initial one where you actually remove turf? I'm just kind of curious. So we said mostly that. where we've done removals right now has really been around municipal buildings. So this building right here, actually we have taken out bluegrass and I think um, Determine what species we put in out here, but um, it's a wheat grass, grass, wheat grass yep, that we put in out here. So much more, um, less water um, needs for those species. Then over at the Sunset Building, we've taken the turf out in front of that. I think we put a dog turf in one area, and on the other side, um, a dog turf, and on the other side, we put like, a rock type landscaping with xeric plants. So we're really doing it on properties that. Um, where we've done the, the taking out of turf and we've done it on city properties that are really municipal buildings and accesses. As far as our parks, it's been a design piece that for probably several years now that we've looked at our parks and said, do we really need all that turf? And we've been designing in more native naturalized areas that could be pollinator habitat, it could be more xeric. They're really trying to supervise that that green space for the cooling and for um, people to get out and just use that. But looking at those peripheries, especially as spaces that really could be designed as more naturalized areas that don't require as much water. And that the next ones coming up would be um, Nino Gallo and Clover Basin, with both ones that have a probably much more significant amount of naturalized area than you would have seen 20 years ago. And I can. Uh, maybe update you too is yeah. that we're we just started this project working with Northern Water oh, on the park yep yes. with the parks department um, so we're doing a, a advanced sprinkler audit on Roosevelt Park and um, uh, Garden, Acres. Garden Acres 
And then um, we also are having them help us determine areas of those parks to transition. So at Roosevelt, there's a hill with some trees on it that's never used. And so we're like, okay, let's put native grass there. Um, and then there are some other potentials to do different varieties of demonstration projects at Roosevelt Park. And then there's a lot of um, space at Garden Acres where we can potentially just reduce the mowing and reduce the watering and kind of let the native species that are already in that area kind of take over where the ditch is. Um, so there are some things that we're working on to do current parks too. Now you said advanced sprinkling? Advanced irrigation audit. Um, and uh, so Northern Water sponsors um, irrigation audits for big properties like golf, golf um, courses and parks. And um, so we're getting this advanced irrigation audit, which an engineering firm is coming in to do a systems-based audit. So they're gonna look at the way the system is designed, not only if our sprinkler heads are efficient, they'll tell us that too, but then they're gonna look at, okay, like this pipe doesn't make sense to hook into this pipe and those things. So I have, I guess, three constituent-related questions that kind of fit into this. So if we're not too strapped for time, um, uh, one is sprinkler system audits. I have had uh, resident complaints about mosquitoes. And um, what I do is I go out and it's always, you know, from an apartment building. Nobody ever, nobody from a single family home ever complains. Right. Right. But um, people don't like the spraying though. And so I go out there and say, yeah, this is all HOA land. We can't get the city to do anything about this standing water. But boy, do these HOAs need a sprinkler system on it. Yeah. So if there's a... There is, yes. Northern Water and our uh, sponsors that as well with Resource Central. Uh -huh. um, so we have a goal to do at least five big properties a year. Um, and so HOAs just have to apply and then it's free for them. Great. Yeah. So we need to like have somebody selling the idea to them. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, including my neighborhood who waters the street a lot. Yeah. Um, That's common. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a constitutional question for Dave, I think, um, which is um, I was in uh, the historic east side and they're worried about their old trees because people are watering their lawns less and the city doesn't water the white right of ways in that yes. HOA list neighborhood, and they're worried that the trees aren't going to get enough water. So, do do we think about that? Do we have a soil test that we can see how the tree is doing? So, we we think about it too, and it's one of the things that we're, we're thinking about as we're looking at. So, there's a couple of things. Water water conservation is something I think is a very responsible way, but also water can get expensive for some people. When you have those large sure. trees there, it really is when you have to start cutting back. Where do you cut back? So, mm -hmm. um, in that historic east side, we're starting to look at those trees and see if there's something we need to do in our code to say we recognize we need to keep this asset um, from from losing that. So we're, we're looking at that right now. So we don't have a new solution, but it's something we have looked at over time, even prior to some of the water conservation, just the idea that we're putting that burden on individuals that may not have the same interest or prioritization mm -hmm. of that city resource within that, that area. Right, so, it used to just be accidental because they were watering right. the spring, the front part of yep, the spring, exactly. but now. So, so we are looking at, so our forestry and timber and the parks group are looking mm -hmm. at that to see how we can do a better job of making sure that we're, meeting our water conservation goals, but also not losing some of the assets. So again, health uh, cooling and all those other pieces for a city. And you also monitor the trees for health, I, I yes. assume, because we've got some ancient cottonwoods that probably are at their end of life anyway. That That's one of the pieces that, um, probably a little bit more you're asking, but as I was going out and looking mm -hmm. at some of our parks and seeing some of the areas that um, I felt were a little bit lacking, is because we really have shifted over and really started looking at some of those more historic, higher quality trees that have a risk to people and property if they fail. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a um, tree limb cycle that we try to get on, like in about every 10 years, every tree gets looked at. And we get, we're taking that down below 10 years now. So really, that's what we've been trying to do is get caught up on all those big trees that are getting older and making sure that the health of those trees is something we want to keep out there in the, um, in the community or if we need to replace mm -hmm. it. 
and if it needs to be pruned in a way that helps maintain the health. So those big trees are um, a high value, high asset, high risk if we don't take care of it. So we've been, we've been focused on those right now. Um, some of the little guys aren't much of a risk, so I've been seeing a little bit more loss in those areas, but we're trying to find that balance. Okay. And we also have part of our, you know, we have a, I'll call it a pre-programmed information, public information um, on water conservation. And part of that, we're, we're, we zero right in on, make sure you continue to water your trees. And even suggest in, in the winter time periods, okay. people get out there in January and February and water their trees and they might not otherwise think of it mm -hmm. because there's no, no leaves there, but, but they, need, mm -hmm. they need moisture. So we do have that in our information pre-program packets. Thank you. Those are both great answers. My last constituent question, the constituent is Allison, who the last time I saw you, Allison, we were both zooming out the door and you mentioned something about if we have water surpluses, do we have a way of leasing it to a consumer on the west slope where the drought is? Mm -hmm. And so because all of our conservation efforts, we, um, we know are pretty much, so far they're proactive, right? You know, we always have enough water. Um, this is just, I don't expect you to have the answer, but I think that the council would approve, you know, some water quality improvement leases, river quality improvement leases, if we had the capability of doing it. But of course, the council has no idea whether the city has the capability of doing it. So we don't have an individual capability of doing it because um, for two reasons. One is the Windy Gap water is only pumped if it's needed. Sure. So it's not, mm -hmm. and sometimes not needed, but don't, <laughs> don't right. pumped. But, um, there isn't, there isn't any excess pump, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, for the CBT system, that underlying water right, um, A, is owned by the federal government, um, and it's just distributed by Northern Water. But um, uh, Longmont, as a allottee, can get an allotment, but, but um, the state law is pretty clear that you can only use Water rights and projects of concerns of the district within the boundaries of the district. Mm -hmm. So, to get around all of that, um, in the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District, I'll say maybe even more the general broader front range mm -hmm. water users have gone together uh, or went together years ago and um, acquired water on the West Slope. Card, um, there's a ditch called the Red Top Ditch, diverts out of the Colorado River, upstream of Shadow Mountain. Shadow, Colorado River goes into Shadow Mountain and then flows down to Grand, Grand Bay. Mm -hmm. um, so they purchased a lot of the shares on the Red Top Ditch. Um, and you can't uh, uh, essentially quit, quit irrigating a bunch of Pine Mountain meadows that. I mean, it was grass hay, nice to go grass hay, but um, better use for that water was leaving it in the stream. So that water from the Red Top Ditch accrues to the project to, to see Shadow Mountain and Lake Gravity, and then it is dedicated to downstream water use. Um, and, and primarily uh, the 15 mile reach. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the endangered fish species on the Colorado River. So that's a fairly effective. It's if I remember right, it's been years, but I remember right, it's around five thousand acre feet. So mm -hmm. that was a lot more effective than if Longmont were to say, "Oh, we got a couple hundred acre feet we could lease." You know. Yeah. So that's five thousand acre feet, um, and then uh, in addition, um, part of the we dig out permit project, the first three, the first 1,800 or so acre feet is assigned to the, uh, goes to the West Slope. So they get to use that. Um, and so that's used, but 
as part of the new uh, settlements with the farming project, if the west slope doesn't need that for consumptive use, i.e. middle park water conservancy district, any of that excess then in August becomes available to the Grand County, who then can use it um, to augment the Colorado River in that August period. Windy Gap is never, hardly ever pumping. It's in never August. pumped in August. But even though it doesn't pump, the, the natural stream flow mm -hmm. uh, is a little, getting a little too warm. Um, so we cool it off of the fish that So it, it goes, it's released in August. So there's a, so the simple answer, simple answer, those programs are actually much more effective. Yeah. They are, they are done. So, um, so it, it, yeah, it, we just can't say I'm going to take a little bit of our water and all and send it somewhere because. Right. And so that's always the answer I've given, and I've never really been sure of my ground. But so I, but I get it, the question a lot. Why like, can't we just put it back? Yeah. And um, so the answer is that regionally, those are those needs are designed in to the extent that we can, and and we're doing what we can. Yeah. And as a municipality, there's not a really effective way to do it. Yeah, and, and it wouldn't be as effective if we tried to do it. But, but certainly, yeah, council's always supported Long Run and, and Northern and yeah. has supported those kind of um, regional, mm -hmm. you know, I think supporting the con connectivity channel and, and the Red Top Ditch deal and, you know, all those things that happen. be wonderful if we could do more, <laughs> but, but it's best done regionally. Right, thank you. Uh, my, does that sound good? <laughs> Reasonable, Allison? I mean, I thought you your thoughts on it too. Well, it's complicated, that's for sure. Very, very good. Yeah. I, I just to cut David back to the city removing turf, and you know, I think it's important that we can aesthetically do some of these things. I mean, things can look pretty good even though grass isn't there. And to the extent maybe we can show for two reasons, here's how good it can look and also we're doing our part, I think that's important. We do too, that's one of the things I think, trying to get out in front where we can do demonstration stuff that fits. You talk about mulching, that mulching can be, you know, wood mulch, it can be rock mulch, rock mulch, it's not this haphazardly that's dumped in a spot and then starts growing weeds in it, but you know, uh, we've done stuff over Roosevelt, the entrance there, we've taken down some of the, the plant materials there and we put in some more Really, my park has gone through like rock by rock places, so it does have an aesthetic look to it. So using rocks, using using organic mulches, um, using right plants in the right place is another really important piece that we, we try to do. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of pieces that, as we think about this, that just taking out turf, turf, bluegrass in itself, it helps water be taken in and absorb more slowly than just running off. So we think about the runoff side, we think about the cooling side of it, we think about the um, greenhouse gas absorption by grasses too. So mm -hmm. how do you strike that balance of keeping our city cool and green while having, again, that water conservation piece? So I think as we keep going forward with this, we'll keep in, in our parks and in our public spaces, get chances to try to evaluate that and hoping with, with Hope, who works very closely with Ben Gratton and my horticulture crew over there, that. Um, that relationship is we can start measuring that too and say, did we achieve our goals? If, you know, if, if the goal is just to reduce water, there's ways to do that. If it's a way to reduce water, maintain those aesthetics, maintain some of those other um, desires of our community, I think that's much harder. I think we're working really hard at achieving that right now, finding that balance. Mm -hmm. That's hopefully going to be part of our Growing Water Smart. We have one person who's really dedicated to creating those metrics and creating project templates so that we can have all of our projects being measured by the same metrics. Um, so that's really important. And then I just want to say that that came up a lot at that point um, at the workshop is that turf not, is not evil. Like that's not what our goal is, is to, like we can't just live in a world without turf. It's important. Um, and, but that's when efficiency comes into play of like, if this is essential turf and it's used, then we want to make sure that it's used and we're watering it in a sufficient way. 
what, what is the incentive for church? What are we offering to the city now? We're offering um, sort of like a stipend, um, so up to seven hundred and fifty dollars um, of working with Resource Central, um, and you can use that money whether you get a discount on having Resource Central remove your turf at a discounted rate. So without being with within the community at Longmont, um, it's two dollars and fifty cents per square foot of removal. Um, with with the resource central program, it's one dollar, um, and so you could use if you have seven hundred fifty square foot that you want to remove, you can just pay them to do all of it, or you can get uh, garden in a box clients. Um, so it's kind of a choose your own adventure stipend that we provide for um, our community members. I'm not familiar with resource central. Yeah, it's a nonprofit that operates out of Boulder, um, and they're they're the ones who run and manage our the majority of our programs. Um, so they're a conservation-based organization that tries to get our communities in Boulder County, um, and actually all across the Front Range. They work all the way up to Greeley, to Colorado Springs, um, and, and actually Pueblo too. So they provide garden in a box is a curated, water-efficient um, program that you basically get a plant-by-number guide, um, and then they give you all the plants and you just follow how to plant it. Um, and then we do their turf removal um, program as well. Um, and then they also provide education. So we, we use them for uh, water-wise seminars that we do twice a year. And um, our slow flow irrigation audits for um, multifamily homes like our HOA properties and businesses, um, churches, big, big properties, um, as well as um, individual homes. In real, real quick on the um, turf conversion piece and what we're doing right now, that was something that I think some council members brought to our attention. The other communities were actually taking part in that and what was Long not doing and we looked yeah. at what we were doing <laughs> and not doing. And it really was Ken, Ken just taking the initiative and saying, we can find some dollar. We, we can't really probably do it all about a budget cycle, but we can find some dollars within our program. So Ken really made that happen. Just Thank you, Ken. Because <laughs> I don't know who else got letters, but I sure did. You know, my neighbor down in Lafayette got yep. their turf removed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If we knew we were going to be there at some point, I said, Ken just said, "Let's just get in front of it and see what we can do." Yeah, and it was right. oversubscribed, right? Yes. Now I'm was. now I'm feeling guilty because I figured I wouldn't get in. Now feel lucky. Yeah, well, I do feel lucky, but it's like, you know. No, don't go there. It's great. So, We're going to get everybody eventually. So the next the next trick is to teach a carbon sequestration class, right? So people know how to manage right. their newly available soil so that it sucks up. Yes. I love that. Okay. David's help with that. Yeah. Yeah. Those grasses, you don't realize how much biomass is underground and really how much uh, carbon sequestration grasses and stuff really provide us. So. Right. And there, are, there are some people in organizations like Stand With Our St. Brain that are heavily right. into that. So Yeah. We definitely work close with that group too. Yeah. yeah good discussion. All right. Okay. John, I have a question. Um, Sorry. So, not to keep going back and forth between the two kind of different conversations, but um, can I have a question about like like the red top ditch deal and things that you were talking about? Who like like where do those projects come from? So, in other words, like this, you know, in, in the case of the couple of examples that you showed like did those come from northern water or from the bureau or from from somebody or reclamation of course um and or, or somebody or did you know from top down or did that come from kind of like some grassroots kind of idea that came that kind of trickled up from the bottom upward or do you remember in those cases the red top no the red top ditch whole concept uh, you uh, credit northern water how it happened was as part of the conversations around the endangered species on the Colorado River. Um, and I don't remember the numbers, but when, when, when a 
Species Conservation Plan is done, or, or more accurately, it's called the um, Recovery Implementation Plan. Um, that identified a, a large amount, I'm going to say like about 15,000 acre feet of land that was needed in the 15 mile reach, which is just upstream of Grand Junction, the critical reach for the endangered uh, fish on the Colorado River. How, how is that going to happen? And uh, so all water providers look pretty hard. Um, some water um, was available out of uh, Root Eye Reservoir. And I think that water is leased. I'm not 100% sure. But there was some excess water in Root Eye. It wasn't a lot. It was a, that was a federal Bureau of Reclamation project that all of the allotment wasn't taken up. Um, so some of the water came from there, and then uh, I believe Denver Water did did a. I hope I'm saying this right. I believe Denver Water did some water out of um, Wolford Mountain Reservoir because when they built Wolford Mountain, they didn't need it. It was half of the Colorado River Water Conservancy District, and half of it was taken up by Denver. But it was the Colorado River, so Windy Gap was built the original project in '85. We made a payment to the West Slope um, to build compensatory storage. So Wolford Mountain was a compensatory storage reservoir for the West Slope for the Windy Gap project. Uh, Denver Water came to the table with some money, um, so they got like capacity in Wolford Mountain for uh, like 50 years or something like that. And then of of that overall capacity, some of that was dedicated to that. So there was some of that, but but then. Um, the water provider in the northern Colorado, you know, through northern water, said, so We've got to come up with some water too. Um, how, how do we do that? And it was determined too difficult to just say, Hey, we've got some water in CBP water to send down there. And that's when the idea of the Red Top Ditch. And so, um, so these actually, are, it's, the, the, the idea comes from these big multi stakeholder kind of engagements, engagements yes. that. But then identify need, then the, the, the various stakeholders go out and try to identify ways to meet that need yeah. and in a collaborative fashion. And and so yeah, that, that makes of course it makes sense. So the Windy Gap project, C B T Northern Water, well C B T purchased a lot of the red top ditch, but Windy Gap project also contributed some. I believe the Fermi project early on contributed a little bit of money to the other time. I, I can't remember how that all broke out. But it, yeah, it was it was a result of regional cooperation and, and you know, Northern Water stepping up saying we need to we need to make this happen. And here's how we can make it happen without impacting you know. And when it's all said and done, Northern Water is it's the representative for the various people <coughs> That, that get water through Northern Water, and, and they're ultimately the, the the stakeholder on those committees or those in those entities. Yeah, and so they, in a way, in, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they represent us in a, in a way on those in those efforts. In, I'm sorry, just just to tell you, let's show how complicated this is. We talk about that regional ability to work with Westlake. You know, when you have that little bit water Longmont has left over, why can't we send it there? Can also get pushes, why can't we use it here? We have local agriculture coming to Longmont quite often saying, if you guys have some additional water, why aren't we using it here in St. Down Ditches? We also have ecosystem needs here that, you know, a lot of those times it'd be nice to have some water in, the, in our, our St. Brain for our fisheries here too. So, you know, trying to deal with these local issues plus those regional issues. Um, Ken and Wes in this group is always going to kind of pull down where is the best place to kind of keep our water, hold our water, make sure we're not drawing things from our next year's needs here locally too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I you know I think not, not to chime in without raising my hand, but um, <laughs> so uh, I do I do yeah, I do think that like you know if, if and we've talked about this I think multiple times it's kind of come up quite a bit I think that there's some interest in this room about having some kind of you know, for lack of a better term, kind of mitigation program, right? Like, but but if Longmont is to control such a thing, right? Then I think 
the water that we that we have the greatest amount of control over is things like you know water up button rock for example you know and to be able to kind of like design our systems in such a way that that, that we're that we're getting water into the same drain in ways that that are helpful to our kind of local ecosystems right and so we've even had discussions within the kind of um the framework of some of you know the options for water coming out of Longmont Dam and, and you know that that project that that would have put water you know further up into the river further upstream for example in, in uh, under varying kind of um uh, you know those options that would put water further upstream in, into um from there so you know those are the types of things that i feel like we may have like some control over and potentially could innovate around i think like the west slope is probably such a complicated discussion mm -hmm. that those things you know th those things are very much outside of our our, our realm of direct influence at the very least but but like i said these kind of local e ecosystem issues we may have more more ability to do something else. i think that's a great idea and if i had been rude enough to ask a fourth question that would have been it you know it was like but i don't know how long the agenda is so i thought maybe we're, another time. Pretty well right yeah. we're, gonna, we're at the close to the end yeah. well yeah. then so well, you got 10 minutes more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ron, this is not a 10 minute question. I frequently am asked by the people on the far edge of the converse, converse, conservation special interest why do we have golf courses? Why don't we dry those up? You know, why don't we? And I always come back and say, well, you know, you probably are in a minority about wanting to dry up the golf courses so far, but what are you going to do with the water that you're not using on those golf courses? And so at some point, it seems to me that we should be developing some hierarchy, you know, because even if you, the water stays on the east slope, you've got golf courses at one end of the spectrum and and keeping our reservoirs full and then you've got uh, agriculture east of us and then you've got sending water down so that the water table out near kansas can be replenished um you know um, I don't, that's a a stretch because i don't really know you know sometimes you read that those are those water tables are at risk um, but I don't know. But it would be it would be good if Longmont had more of a policy about that, yeah. or maybe you know internally we do and it's not articulated. But uh, I just think it's something to think about. Yeah, we certainly can put more detail to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Our guiding water principle says that if we have um, excess water that we can use. That is, you know, that doesn't impact our water supply. Mm -hmm. That we can use that for some environmental projects. Mm -hmm. um, and that's um, not a very specific. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with that guiding water principle. Mm -hmm. But yeah, more meat on that could be. Um, well, but, yeah, and that's right because. Uh, when when the council is asked a question like why are we wasting water on golf courses we don't have an answer for where is the other unmet need mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know because in Longmont right now we don't have any unmet needs um, but there might be you know higher and better uses than a golf course at some point in the future and so we should have thought it through before, you know, there are more than three people in the city that are asking that question. But you know, it's three. Just a question about golf course watering. Is that all? Is that treated water we are using? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, or? Two or more courses, or raw water, and a lot of 
number of corpses is treated. Some sort of treated. Some sort of treated. You know, and I heard that I always thought there was ditch water running right through Sunset, and why are we using treated water? I'm sure I'm missing something, but maybe all that water that runs through there is spoken for. I, I don't know. Yeah, it make any sense at all. Historically, there was um, some ditches that ran through there, and I think at one time it probably was irrigated through and through all the water. I heard that too. Um, but, but at some point, it was transferred over to treated. It, um, so. I was going to say, your staff is always thinking that way. I know Ken had just talked to me again about it, but you know, it's, there's definitely those trade offs as far as you know, that's a conversation that we need to have with recreation because. You know, managing a group that managed some parts with domestic water or treated water and some with raw water. Raw water has definitely some challenges for the operational side of things. You get filters and pumps and ponds and all those pieces. Um, so it, it does have some challenges. But I know Ken and I have just recently talked about his desire to say what can we really do to look at trying to make sure as we convert parks to raw water, also do that for all of our golf courses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I do apologize. I have a four o'clock with Dave. Thank you, David. Yep. Glad, glad we got this yes. into the discussion. I was going to say, it started stirring. Yeah. See you, David. Thank you. All right. Okay, moving on. Uh, uh, sure. yeah. Can you what? <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> um, just a couple of things. This has been a really great discussion, and I, I would love it if we could continue it. I think that to take your point, we are. A lot of the water that we get from the West Slope mm -hmm. is by virtue of our participation in deals with Northern. So Northern, in some ways, is our representative, but also we are their client. And to the extent we have interests in figuring out solutions where some of the water that we would otherwise divert or conserve can be put back into the West Slope system when and where it's needed, I think that voicing that interest to Northern if it doesn't come from us, who would it come from? And they're the ones who are going to know their system better than anybody else. But if they don't have somebody coming to them and telling them that that's what they would like to see happen, why would they do it? I mean, their goal is to deliver water to us for what we want it for. If, we're, if that's all we're telling them that we want from them, then why would they ever do anything? And then, so that's point number one. Point number two is there's a lot of reservoirs up there. There's a lot of different Bureau of Reclamation contracts up there. One of the things that my organization does is it buys water from the Bureau of Reclamation that is already decreed for hydropower, and it delivers it down to Orchard Mesa, which is right by a 15 mile reach, for hydropower purposes. So it takes things that are already decreed for certain uses and buys them and gets them to where they want it. And the key there is time. The fish recovery program is about 300 to 400 CFS short almost every year. It's getting worse in the late summer, and it's a matter of timing. Didn't know that. Yeah, it's and it's just this really discrete period. It's not all fall time. It's just this one discrete period because you have different calls on the river, and it's when this big call down comes off. All of these trans basin diverters are like, oh man, now's our time. Go for it, and you just seriously pump like crazy just to refill and then for example the line for it goes dry almost every year for this exact reason and if we could just figure out ways to retime that and just get the water back in the river just for that discrete period of time it would make a heck of a difference the last point is and i think you were touching upon this there's programs out there, we don't want to lose our water rights. Like that's something that Long has done an incredibly good job of shoring up over the course of you know, 70, longer years. If we do loss of conservation, which I, I totally think we should, we should be cognizant of the fact that by not using that water, we're opening ourselves up to decrease in the historic consumptive use, which diminishes the value of our water rights and also potential abandonment. There are programs out there that are intended to protect that, but they take doing to get them in place. So to the extent we want to protect our water rights, but simultaneously take advantage of the fact that we can do conservation, I think we should marry the two so they work into one. Okay, that's, those are great points. I didn't know that either. Um, and I just want to put in, uh, 
in terms of regional influence and something that we Longmont have at least some struggle with is the water rights that belong to the Platte River Power Authority because they are in the next 15 years, probably unless they get heavily into hydrogen electrolysis, um, are, are going to need less water. And they've got more water than they need now. And so, A, those water rights need to be protected or properly disposed of. And even if they're in electrolysis, I mean, that's a pump that you prime and then you can recapture the water and use it over and over again. So um, we should use our influence with PRPA on water policy, I guess. It's part of, part of that whole general, it's, it's not an immediate need, but we shouldn't be caught flat-footed on this. Was that a point? I'm not sure. Um, in terms of providing water to agriculture, I think that's great if we can do that. We should time it in a way that not only does it deliver large agriculture, but maybe it like fortifies the stream in between. So, say we know that the Saint Frank Creek really tanks in like 15 days in September. That's when we do like time our deliveries to ag that's downstream of that dry stretch. So we can do both. It doesn't have to be a zero sum. And we can do the same. We'll do it with the same water. Same water. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is a lot of it is just come out so far past in my eyes that the dry up point is down here. Mm -hmm. uh, so like on the island system, I'm pulling out way of my lines to, to do that. You know. But the the dry up is down here, mm -hmm. and that's where you're seeing a lot of the dry stream. So. Yeah. Ken Butt has a bill that he runs periodically about farther east ditches. Um, you know, I'm not Ken Buck's biggest fan, but there is a bill out there that might fund rearranging the ditches so that they so that seasonal needs would be better addressed by the network. You know, speaking of maybe unused water, um, when's the last time the comp plan has been updated or is in the process of being updated now, March or? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, just because I'm not smart enough to look at the budget and see whether um, that those pieces are in there. Um, you know, there, there's comp plans, new comp plan items in the budget, but I don't know how much of a revision there is. Do you think? Yeah, I, I don't. You know, they kind of indicated to us that they would really like to get started on a comp plan update within the year. Mm -hmm. I believe they're, they're looking to start their RFQ process, RFQ process, um, within this year or next year to get a consultant to yeah, and that was the thing I was talking with you and, and Harold about too is is yeah yeah is, is is what densities we model because you know the planners are looking at considerable increases in density, which means you know less turf. Yeah. Well, that's more that's up where my thought. It just seems like mm -hmm. our densities are. I don't know if they were planned for, but it's, it's coming our way. And right. do we have, you know, what are the consequences water-wise? You know, yeah. very so, long range, but you know, well, it's all it's stuff not, to think about. It's not lot, that long range anymore. You know, we're because because of the housing crunch that we're in on from many different directions, um, from people needing houses, housing to you know, we don't really know if we got more than 120,000 people here, which is the end of our current comp plan. We don't know how how much water we would, yeah. how many, how much population we could we could support. 
I can't tell you the, the, what you're currently seeing out there, which you know does look at was really contemplated in the last comp plan update, which was then incorporated into our latest, most recent water future water supply demand analysis. So we have the water for what you're, what's happening now and what you're seeing now. Um, yeah, um, if the comp plan updates has significant, and I'm not talking going from four stories to five stories, you know. 20, yeah, yeah. You know, really, it's really significant increases. Then, then we would have to take a look at that. But I can tell you, um, without doing the, running the numbers yet, um, water conservation is going to play an enormous role in meeting that future demand. I'm very confident in our conservation program. It's going to, it's going to take us, it's going to really take us and help us. And, and, um, so that will be very significant. Mm -hmm. Then the second was we have projects, conditional filings and projects out there that we, we can rely on. The, the, the water we would need to get would be attainable through projects um, in it's money, but it's attainable. It's a little bit different than what I, you know, when I think about Aurora. They're growing out to the east bare bone dry country, you know, they don't, they, they got to do something else. And mm -hmm. They're going to get water somewhere yeah. and different than Walnut. Well, very fortunate to have, to have no. the foresight in the project. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and just one last thing. Uh, your comment about some influence in northern water, I don't know if you ever, where did that, are you asking the question where that can come from or? How do we influence them? Well, I'm not sure where you were going with that. Um, I guess asking them the question first. I mean, I don't know. I, I would defer to Ken to tell us more than that. Or well, um, Marcia and I sit on a on, a, on the windy gap, the which is a subset. But the other question I have is is um, we had I wrote recommendations for two former water board members to be on the Northern Water Board. I don't know whether either of them were selected or not. Well, Todd's, Todd's, Todd's on the Northern there. Board and Dennis Shantunas is on the Northern Board. Okay. Both former board, water, water, water board members. Okay, so two out of three. I didn't, three. De Dennis was before my time, I believe. Yeah, not too long. I mean, yeah, or, or yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe he was, uh, I he didn't ask me for a recommendation. Okay. Pam was, she used to sit where Roger's sitting all the time. Um, she's favorite. Yeah. No, the, what, it wasn't Pam. What was no, it wasn't. Um, Renee Davis may have. Yeah, I think maybe. Might have been it. Maybe she moved out of the area, so. Yeah, she moved out to Denver. Yeah, so she would have been, had to resign if she was selected. Right. But, but yeah, I, I think not only Longmont, Influencing the board, but the other from you know, you know, we, we've got Boulder who is you know, who can no, always do that. Um, Longmont and um, Broomfield, you know, Fort Collins is really leaning there. You know, um, yeah, I think, yeah. I, think, yeah, I think generally the larger municipalities would, yeah, can do that. You know, their board just needs to hear from us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, it takes yeah. a while. <laughs> and, and that means that, that the people who know what could be suggested, um, you know, need to raise the issues before the council and then we can push the policy suggestions around. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to just really quickly add in. I mean, so. Those West Slope issues, are, I guess the point I was trying to get to before was that those West Slope issues are so publicized. You know, I mean, it's the Colorado River, it's a big thing, right? And and um, so there's these multi-stakeholder entities that need to make, figure out what is needed on the river and, and what we can do, et cetera, right? Um, and I agree that, you know, being engaged with that and, and especially working with 
you know, our partners to and pressure, pressuring or, or you know working with them in some way to kind of you know be engaged in those programs is really important. Of course, you know, having worked for smaller kind of you know for for kind of you know similar organizations to kind of like Colorado Parks and Wildlife or something, but on smaller streams and rivers, right? Those are, of course, not nearly as publicized. I mean, I don't know that any of us could, I mean, I think some of us in here could figure out what is needed on the West Slope or, or you know, heard that in the news or something, but, but for example, what's needed in the St. Brain, right? And we worked with our kind of like local, very local, hyper-local uh, program managers and things with Fish and Wildlife and Parks just right here in our local area that we could potentially have influence on by, by helping with the needs in our local streams and rivers that we again have more kind of control over, right? And I feel like, you know, those issues of course are of lesser priority, both at Fish and Wildlife, you know, uh, but also, uh, you know, with news organizations and things like that, such that we don't really know what is needed in this kind of local, hyper-local kind of area, right? But, but again, I think that those types of projects those are the types of places that our local populace goes, you know, on weekends to go fishing, et cetera. And if it was like, if there was a sign at some, you know, uh, I, I don't know, some popular fishing spot that basically said, you know, some fraction of this water was provided by your local water, and you know, organization, by the city of Longmont, essentially. You know, those are the types of things I think that really do a good job of kind of like leading by example, by kind of uh, exemplifying the values that Longmont wants to, or, or, you know, being the change that we want to see in the world, essentially, you know, those are the types of things that I think we have more control over and are maybe a little bit easier wins than trying to solve the West Slope problems, although you should, of course, be engaged in that as well. But um, anyway, those are my yeah, and, and all, along that line, the same we work closely, Kevin work really closely with the same rain and left down water conservancy yeah. district on a stream management plan. Yeah. That stream management plan really gives you a guidance of what we need locally on the same Grand Creek, yeah. all the way from environmental flows to recreational flows to um, projects right. and, and rehab. And so yeah, that um, I think that is the stream management plan is kind of our local area's goal or vision for helping the same dream. So, yeah. I, I agree. We, that, that we can have some influence on. <laughs> and I, and I, I believe the district is um, interested in trying to now, they've made the plan now, start moving forward with it. Interesting. Okay. Item 11. Informational items and water board correspondence. You know, I had a question, and I don't know if it pertains particularly to this uh, item, but in the information Heather sent us, sent us some information about board appointments. Um, and if we had anybody in mind that might be interested in water, I was just kind of curious, Tom and Allison, did you, have you two come up with anything? Anybody that you have proposed to, to apply for the board? I mean, and you don't need to share, but I mean, is that something that yeah. there's some movement on? Well, I'll, I'll just mention, so I, I have not uh, um, suggested anyone. So my, my problem is that my kind of community, my water community, you know, is kind of distant from local, right? Because I, I mean, my, my work is down in Denver, yeah. and I, you know, I do engage in a variety of different kind of statewide issues. But I don't necessarily, um, you know, my this is my first kind of foray into the Longmont water scene, let's say, and um, and and, and uh, so the so, so I'm relying on all of you really to be kind of to, to learn from, um, and so I haven't. Uh, other than out inside this entity, you know, I haven't really kind of uh, engaged outside. So, uh, I'll, well, maybe with some folks at left hand, but um, so uh, that's been my issue. I don't know. 
Yeah, I reached out when we had our last survey. Um, I was particularly interested in Cambridge engineering. Um, and I have a question. There's a couple of water engineering firms in town. Uh, well, I mean, if we can do that, I, I've tried and did not get much movement. Person I was looking at. So anyway, yeah, I mean, it's too bad. We, I hope we can fill another position. We'll have to see how it, how it works out. I know there was one individual. He's a more of a development community that was interested, but he um, didn't get his application in on time, and so when it's reposted, I believe he's going to reapply. Well, it's it's opening now to to reapply. It is. Mm -hmm. So if there's some out there. In fact, I, I don't know what's the cutoff date, October. Yeah, thirty first or something. But October fourteenth. October fourteenth. Yeah. yeah. So give that guy a poke. Sorry. <laughs> I said, give that I guy a poke. I will. Yeah. Yep, I will. And I'll and I will contact the city clerk's office to see if they've received any. For all I know, they've already received some. I don't know. I, I don't know either. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Roger, okay, uh, if I could add one thing on that, I was going to bring up anyway. <laughs> um, as you may re remember, um, there's a little bit of a new uh, interview process right. with right. boards. Right. And so we'll be asking um, board, the water board, on our October board meeting if anybody's interested. We'll be on the interview team and and say, you know, whether you do it as a, a you know, all, all the board members or generally the city clerks that's saying if that's uh, <coughs> just a couple so you don't overwhelm the applicants, but but you know, certainly could do it as a board. And, and we'll probably set those interviews up in November so that information can be given to council and then council does the final interview if they need an interview and selection in December. So. Well, we had that discussion, and as, as I recall, the way we left it is we would individually decide if we want to be in interviews or not. And if we want to be in the interviews, I think we left it. So be it. So that's kind of where we left it. And I know somebody saying, well, two is the number. But I didn't get that indication if it was. So. Um, actually, two is the number. So you can do it as in this meeting so that it's a posted meeting. Um, or if you want to have a, an extra meeting uh, to do it, you can either do it with two so that it doesn't have to be posted, or you need to get the city clerk's office to post it a week in advance. If if all you know you wanted to have it without the staff and but you know more than two board members, okay. so it's just like any other yeah, right. open meetings and law thing. So, anyway, we'll ask in October. Okay, very good. We'll follow up with the board on that. Just the last one. item. Um, item scheduled for future board meetings. Any questions or comments on, on what we have listed in our program? Okay. Or anybody want to add anything to it? Kind of wonder. Um, so, so, so we tend to have what I've noticed. I, so, when I first started back, back, you know, whatever it was last year, let's say through that fall and into the kind of winter, we were really heavily engaged with a lot of discussion about cash and move. And I think that 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 one's kind of you know kind of self-sustaining because there was this big change, you know, that that we were asked to kind of participate in. That's somewhat self-sustaining at this point. Um, you know, sometimes we have development activities, sometimes we don't. Um, and and then what I tend to notice is just like this meeting, right? It seemed like there wasn't a whole lot uh, kind of to chat about. Three thirty rolled around, and it was kind of like, well, gosh, I don't, I, we might be out of here by three forty-five. Uh, and then we kind of like had almost like an impromptu type workshop in a way, right? About kind of some kind of bigger issue, right? But but um, where a lot of questions came up and, and we were talking a lot about, you know, different conservation approaches and, and the like. So um, 
So I'm wondering whether we should have almost kind of a, a, a list of tackling some of these bigger issues in a, in a slightly more prepared way than, than, you know, than just kind of chatting kind of informally when the time is available, you know, like when it seems like we're going to wind down at 345 and then all of a sudden we can start chatting about stuff, whether or not we kind of build in, you know, a half an hour or something into each of these meetings that could be the first thing to kind of get, get knocked off the, the list if the discussion of the other issues runs longer than expected or something, right? And so whether there are kind of topic areas that we could have a more kind of considered and uh, discussion where we all kind of expect that that's what we're going to talk about if the time allots or something. Um, and I, so, so those types of things could be many of the things that we talked about today, right? I mean, it could be things about how to kind of manage water a little differently to kind of keep water in the river for various times of year, et cetera. It could, and, and you know, we could have a, a point person who has in their hip pocket kind of the, the talking points. Um, on those issues, again, if the time, if, if the, I mean, of course, give priority to the things that are on the agenda, but maybe have a half an hour's discussion kind of in our hip pocket, waiting if we have time that may kind of, um, well, that we can have those discussions. I think it's a good point. I think my thoughts are is if we have something burning that we feel that we're time restricted on, um, if somebody has something like that, we ought to feed that to Ken or have that. So we all know that it's sitting out there if we can tackle it. And, and you know, I have no problem with that. And uh, it probably would be a little more uh, thought provoking if we knew that's down the line and, and we could sit and think about it. Isn't that what the call at the beginning of every meeting for adding items to future agendas is there for? Because you know, as a, the, the stimulus this time was the report about the workshop, right? And it was, oh, well, you know, if, if, if all that's on the table, here are all these other topics. Now, what a time for Heather not to be here, <laughs> right? Because ideally she would prepare a list and then we would put those on future agendas, but not all at once. Well, we are, I, we are recording. So, yeah. Heather, will, Heather, will, Heather will help us. Heather will help. Okay. Well, that's a good point. So, it was a good discussion. I mean, absolutely. I'm glad we had the time yeah. because. We're still yeah. on half an hour early. Yeah. yeah. But, no, no, but yeah. Mark, I gave you 10 minutes and you took 25. <laughs> no, 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 no. I took my 10. It just was so interesting. That no, was a good discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Well, given that, let's adjourn the meeting. It was a good meeting.